Our next speaker is uh, Ben Fish, uh, part of the Stanford uh, Applied Crypto team. Um, and he's done uh, a lot of work that's very relevant to, uh, to the blockchain space. So um, proofs of replication, um, proofs of space. Uh, he's also one of the uh, co-authors on the um, uh, paper that defined the notion of VDFs. Um, he's also worked on um, accumulators and batching techniques and, and vector commitments. And uh, one of his uh, you know, latest works, which is really, really exciting, um, is uh, Docs, uh, which he's going to talk about today. Uh, thank you, Justin. Okay, so today I'll be talking about our latest work on transparent uh, SNARKs. Uh, this is work that uh, we put out around in the fall, and we've also made some improvements that I'll, uh, that I'll mention throughout the talk, but the bulk of the talk will focus on uh, what we published in the fall. So the concrete result is a new snark with no trusted setup, uh, and the, this, this snark is notable for having relatively practical proof sizes, or under 10 kilobytes for 1 million gates, which is what is novel about a, a snark with no trusted setup. Um, we, we have other types of snarks that are um, based on FRI, and so previously you were seeing snarks with no trusted setup in the range of um, you know, over 100 kilobytes. So the most significant thing about this new snark is its uh, relatively small proof size. Uh, and the verification still performs well under, say, 100 milliseconds. And asymptotically, we can say that the, the size in, uh, of the proof and the verification time is uh, logarithmic in the degree of the, uh, in the uh, size of the, of the circuit that is being proved, uh, with some other constant factors that uh, also depend on the security parameter, which is why we write O lambda. And the main new tool that we're using here is a polynomial commitment scheme using groups of unknown order. So this new tool is then plugged into other machinery that uh, was developed by, by many other people over the course of years. And, um, and so this, we apply this key new tool in order to get this new type of snark. So let me tell you what a polyno polynomial commitment is, as the bulk of my talk is going to focus on not the other machinery that we plug this polynomial commitment into, but the, polyno the new polynomial commitment scheme itself. So informally, a polynomial commitment scheme allows a, uh, one party to commit to a polynomial, say over the field FP, of degree D, or at most D, with a small value, c. So c is going to be ideally constant size. And then later, be able to prove that the evaluation of this committed polynomial on some point z is equal to some target point y. And again, the idea would be to be able to give a small proof. Ideally constant size, although if we could give something which is polylogarithmic in d, that would also be pretty good. So a bit more formally, a, a polynomial commitment has this starts with the syntax of a normal commitment scheme, where you have perhaps a setup procedure that generates some public parameters, a, uh, a commitment to the polynomial, which will produce this small value, as well as an opening uh, protocol, which could open the entire polynomial. And then the additional thing that it has is this eval protocol. And we like to describe the eval protocol first as an interactive uh, protocol that is something called a public coin interactive protocol. And once you describe a public coin interactive protocol, then as a heuristic, you can make it non-interactive by applying something called the Fiat-Shamir heuristic. Um, so as for performance, we want the normal part of the commitment scheme to be succinct in the sense that the commitments are much smaller than the size of the original polynomial. So ideally proportional to the security parameter and not to the size of the polynomial. And the communication in the, in the interactive eval protocol, uh, we would also like to be sublinear in the size of the, uh, of, of the, of the polynomial. And then if you compile that to a non-interactive proof, that turns into 
a proof size which would be sublinear in the size of the original polynomial. When we say sublinear, we ideally would like to build something which is polylogarithmic or even proportional to the security parameter, and in this work we'll get something which is logarithmic in the degree. As for security, you want the commitment part to satisfy the standard definition of commitment binding. I should not be able to open a polynomial commitment to two different polynomials. And then from the interactive protocol, you want it to satisfy this generalization of commitment binding, which is evaluation binding, meaning I can't convince you that the committed polynomial evaluates to two different values on the same point. Uh, for any given point, there's only a unique target point that I can convince you this polynomial evaluates to. So I'm committed to its evaluation points. And a slightly stronger property would be to say that if I'm able to run this eval protocol and convince you of the evaluation of the polynomial on any given point of your choice, then I must actually know the entire polynomial. So this is saying that it's an argument of knowledge, meaning that I can't succeed in this protocol unless I actually know the whole polynomial itself. We would also like um, to have some hiding properties in order to plug this into a zero-knowledge proof system. Uh, and for that, we would say that the commitment scheme needs to be hiding as a standard commitment scheme, meaning that from a commitment, you have no information about what the committed polynomial is. And the interactive protocol should be a zero-knowledge argument of knowledge, uh, meaning that if you only learn what the claim is, you only learn the evaluation of the polynomial on a point, you don't learn anything else about the polynomial. Another thing that we would talk about is whether the polynomial commitment scheme has transparent setup or not. So what is a transparent setup? Well, remember there is this setup procedure at the beginning which generates some public parameters uh, for the scheme. And if that setup procedure requires some secrets that must be discarded after the process, then it's called a trusted setup. And often that would be implemented through a multi-party computation in order to distribute that trust among several parties. It's the same concept that you probably have heard in the context of snarks, where there, uh, there are certain snarks which are tr trusted set up. They have a ceremony at the beginning to establish parameters for the scheme. Um, this has been talked about as generating toxic waste, meaning secrets that have to be discarded or destroyed. You heard a little bit about that yesterday. And, um, and it's the same thing here. And in fact, what we'll see down the road is if we have a polynomial commitment scheme that does not require a trusted setup, then we can build snarks that do not require a trusted setup. So the previous construction, which is the most performant construction of polynomial commitment schemes, um, requires a trusted setup. It requires the trusted party or group of parties who are doing a multi-party computation to compute powers of this group element G, where this S exponent or powers of S are secret and have to be destroyed and discarded after the entire procedure. If anyone fi figures out what S is later, then the security of the protocol is broken. So our main result is to try to build a polynomial commitment scheme that does not require any trusted setup, okay? But that still has decent performance. And so what we end up doing is, is getting a, a, a transparent setup polynomial commitment, uh, and we get an evaluation argument that, as I mentioned before, scales logarithmically in the size of the polynomial, so the degree of the polynomial. There's also a generalization to a multivariate um, variant I won't talk about. Um, and we apply this in order to build a transparent setup snark for arithmetic circuits where the size of the snark scales logarithmically in the size of the circuit. And I'll explain all, a lot more how all this gets plugged together throughout the talk. So just to start with a rough comparison of um, what we end up with in the end with this transparent snark and how it you know, roughly compares in terms of its asymptotics to other snarks out there. 
We have the most performant uh, snarks, which are not transparent and uh, require, like, they don't even have something called universal setup. That would be like Groth 16. It requires a new setup for every different type of uh, circuit or computation which is being proven. But those are the most performant. And then you have much more, more recently, you have, uh, you have Plunk and other uh, systems similar to Plunk, like Marlin or Sonic which have a universal setup, so they're still not transparent, and they perform uh, very competitively with, with Gross 16. So you see that the proof size is uh, going to be basically a constant number of group elements, and the verification time is, uh, is, is, is basically just one pairing. Uh, it's actually, this is a little bit inaccurate, it's a couple pairings. But um, then you have Starks, which are also transparent, and you have many other things in the class of Starks, like Fractal. Um, I'll give more detailed comparisons later. Uh, but you basically have this class of FRI-based uh, proof systems. And they are not only transparent, but quantum secure. But you have asymptotically much uh, larger proof sizes that are um, scaling like log squared of the size of the computation. And that's where you end up getting these, uh, you know, maybe uh, around a million gates, you get around 100 to, to 200 kilobytes in size versus around 10 kilobytes in size, which is what you have with what we're calling supersonic. So supersonic sits kind of in the middle. It's transparent. It has a proof size that scales logarithmically in the degree. And the verification time is the logarithmic number of exponentiations. But these different exponentiations across different schemes don't directly compare because they're exponentiations in different types of groups. So in supersonic, we're doing it in RSA groups or class groups, whereas in, uh, in Gross 16 or Planck or Bulletproofs, it will be over prime groups. And in, and in FRI-based schemes, we're computing hashes. So it's a little hard to compare just based on the asymptotics. This is just to give you a rough idea. And then Bulletproofs, of course, is uh, is good on prover time and proof size, but it is linear in the circuit in terms of verification time. So for very large circuits, say on a million gates, it would not scale at all. So let's go through the main construction, um, which will be the rest of the, the, the main focus of this talk, which is how to get this new polynomial commitment scheme. So we start with an integer encoding of this polynomial over this field FP. So we represent a polynomial um, over FP as an integer polynomial simply by mapping the coefficients to representatives in the range 0 to P. Right? And then we choose uh, another integer Q, which is greater than P. In fact, later you'll see we have to choose Q to be uh, substantially greater than P. But I, you'll see that I'm cheating a little bit now, just for simplicity. We output the encoding, which is this f hat of q, which is going to be just an integer in z. So to give you an example, if f hat of x um, was this 4x cubed plus 2x squared, et cetera, then if we were, and q was equal to 10, then the encoding, the integer encoding of this polynomial would simply be the number 4213. So notice that now I've only described how we're mapping these polynomials to integers. We're going to, we haven't done anything to make this uh, a commitment scheme or succinct. It's still the same size as the original polynomial f. But the whole point is that I've mapped it to the integers. And now what we're going to do is use integer commitments. So let me first convince you that a, this is a valid encoding, meaning that you can get back to the original polynomial from the encoding. So uh, the first fact to observe is just that every integer in this range, 0 to q to the d plus 1, is uniquely decodable to an integer polynomial with positive coefficients. And that's just doing base q decomposition of the number that you got. All right, so over here, base 10 decomposition would give you the original coefficients back, 4, 2, 1, 3. 
We actually need a slightly fancier fact because we're going to, uh, as a detail that comes out of the construction, we're actually going to, to, to use, uh, to encode them as integers that could also be negative. Uh, but then it turns out that they're decodable to um, polynomials with coefficients of absolute value bounded by Q over two. So notice also that this encoding has some homomorphic properties. If you add the encoding of F and the encoding of G, then you get the encoding of F plus G as long as Q is sufficiently larger than the coefficients of the original polynomial. What you're trying to prevent here is overflow. So you can still basically use base Q decomposition. You need the coefficients of F plus G to still be smaller than Q. And this is why, as I said before, that we're, in the end, we're going to get a protocol where we have to choose Q to be substantially larger than the original polynomials because we're going to be doing homomorphic operations on encodings and the coefficients will be growing. So we want the coefficients um, of the added polynomials to still be smaller than this Q that we're using for the encoding. We also have this interesting property called a monomial homomorphism which is that if I have um, f of x and I want to derive, and I have f of q, which is the encoding of f, and I want to derive an encoding of x to the k times f of x, then that's just simply q to the k times f of q. So then what we're going to do is we're going to use uh, this key object called a group of unknown order, Okay, and this group of unknown order, what it does is it gives us the ability to commit to integers, and the commitment is not only succinct, it's just one group element, but it is also homomorphic. So if I have the commitment g to the x for an integer x, then g to the x times g to the y is g to the x plus y. So the way that we're going to commit is basically in get our integer encoding of the polynomial, that's f hat of q, and then just commit to this integer f hat of q. And this will inherit the same homomorphic property if I have an integer, if I have this integer commitment to f hat of q, and an integer commitment to, say, a different polynomial g hat of q, then I can multiply the commitments to get a commitment to g to the f hat plus g hat of q. So there are several different types of groups of unknown order. Uh, the most uh, certain one is the RSA group. This is just based on the um, RSA assumption. And uh, basically, if you take n to be a large number, which is the multiple of two secret large primes, p and q, then you get a group of integers co-prime with, uh, with with the order of the group, which under, uh, form a group under multiplication mod n. And so for, like, say, a 3048-bit n, you get around 120-bit security, we believe. The only problem with this, um, with this group of unknown order is that it requires someone to choose the secret p and q, so it, it is not a trustless setup group of unknown order. And so if we were to use this for our scheme, then we would not have trustless setup. We would have something called universal setup, but we wouldn't have trustless setup. But the RSA groups are, say, based on the most standard assumptions. So then we have class groups, which um, are also believed to give us groups of unknown order. Um, we believe it's hard to compute the order of the group. It's also hard to take odd prime roots in these things called class groups. But the, the really nice thing about class groups is that all you need to do is specify something called the discriminant of the group, and then you can start doing operations in this group. So it doesn't require anyone to produce some kind of trusted uh, setup parameters. Nobody has to choose some secret numbers, which are then discarded later. And so for a discriminant around 1,600 bits, we believe to get um, around 120-bit security, about equivalent to 3,048-bit RSA. And this will also the discriminant will also, size will tell you the size of the group element representation itself. There's also a new candidate group of unknown order that uh, appeared on ePrint maybe just a few days ago. Um, so I would say this would naturally be the, the least 
trusted type of assumption, but it, it is very exciting because this new group, which is, which is based on Jacobian groups of genus 3 hyperelliptic curves, has a group element size of just 303 bits, they claim, for around the same security of 120 bits. So that's the conjecture in this new work, and this will require further study, um, but this would be extraordinarily exciting because it would give us excellent performance with what I'm going to show you. So the main part of uh, the dark polynomial commitment scheme is now, I showed you how to commit to polynomials. How do you do the evaluation protocol? So the intuition is that I'm going to describe a recursive protocol where at every step, I basically split the polynomial into a left part and a right part. So I start with a polynomial of degree d. I split it into two halves, which, um, which each have degree d. But uh, if I split it into two halves, which each have degree d, then that wouldn't help. So actually, what I'm going to tell you is that fl and fr are basically a polynomial of polynomials of degree d over 2 where FL has the left half of the coefficients and FR has the right half of the coefficients. So in other words, F of X is equal to FL of X plus X to the D over 2 times FR of X. I've just factored out all the X to the D over 2 terms uh, from the right part of the polynomial. So now I have two polynomials, FL and FR, which are degree D over 2. And then what do we do? Well, the verifier is going to send a random challenge to the prover. And then the prover is going to, um, both the prover and the verifier um, are basically going to compute FL of X plus alpha times FR of X. And so that gets replaced with this new F prime of X. And now this thing is degree D over 2, and we recurse. Now, obviously, this is not the actual protocol because this would not be succinct. I'm sending these polynomials in the clear. This was just to give you the information theoretic uh, intuition about what's happening. What actually happens is that we're going to leverage the homomorphic properties of the commitment to do exactly the same thing over commitment. So the prover sends a commitment to the left part and the right part. Um, and then the verifier uh, can basically use the homomorphism of the commitment to compute this linear combination of the two polynomials in the exponent and derive g to the f prime of q. Now, putting a bit more information in here, um, in order to convince you that it evaluates to a certain value, we also have to set, send some extra terms. So basically, the prover is going to send the claimed evaluation point y um, equals f of z modulo p. And then the prover will send the evaluation of the left polynomial on this point z as well as the right polynomial. The verifier will be able to check on its own that y is consistent with yl plus, uh, plus z to the q to the d over 2 times yr. And so the left part and the right part is equal, are equal to YL and YR if, if and only if the original polynomial evaluates to Y at the point Z. Now, there's only one part that I haven't explained yet, which is how does the verifier check the consistency of the left commitment and the right commitment with the original commitment? In other words, how does it verify that this left commitment CL times CR to the Q to the D over 2 is equal to the original C. Also note that this is leveraging the monomial homomorphism, which is that we're able to um, co compute the commitment to the polynomial x to the d over 2 times fr of x by using uh, q to the d over 2 in the exponent. So this last part is going to use uh, this proof of exponentiation trick. It's the same trick that's used, the key trick that's used for VDFs. And um, the way we described it in the original dark paper, it's using Wesolowski's proof of exponentiation. And so this is basically a protocol in order to convince you that CR to the Q to the D over 2 is equal to some group value, C over CL. 
The reason why we need a proof of exponentiation is because it would be too expensive for the, for the verifier to run this exponentiation on its own. It has size you know, linear in, in, the, in the degree of the polynomial, and, and we want to have a scheme which has logarithmic verification time. So without going through the details, um, because I want to get to other material, proof of exponentiation is a re really, really neat interactive protocol that allows you um, to, to verify a claim of this form where the verifier is, is very efficient. There's one extra issue, which is that every time we recurse, we multiply one of the polynomials by this random challenge alpha. And alpha is going to be, say, chosen in the range 0 to p. So the coefficients of the polynomial get larger and larger with each level of recursion. So what we actually end up needing to do is to set this encoding point q to be greater than p to the 2 log d. And that's so that after we do multiple levels of recursion, the homomorphic operations still work. So <clears throat> the final step, when we get to the last level of recursion, we end up with a degree 0 polynomial, just an integer. So the prover will just send this integer directly to the verifier, and the verifier will check whether this integer is indeed the integer um, consistent integer commitment, as well as check a bound on the size. And this, checking this bound on the size, checking that f0 is less than p to the log d, will imply that all the other polynomials were also um, had, had coefficients within a correct bound. And that's not a security proof, but we we'll go through the work of showing a security proof to, to do that more formally. The intuition is that this check at the end is going to imply that all the polynomials above were, were encoded properly, and therefore that they were binding commitments. So in the end, the proof size is going to be from, from all the recursion, 2 log d group elements and 2 log d field elements. Um, the verification time is around 2 log d uh, exponentiations in G. The proof size is like 2 log d plus 3 p log d. And the prover time can be also be optimized with pre-computation, so you get uh, down to O of p times d operations. So the original security theorem is that, very informally, the dark evaluation protocol is an argument of knowledge um, based on the following assumptions, low order assumption, strong RSA assumption, and adaptive root assumption. All of these assumptions pertain to um, groups of unknown order. Um, and here's a rough asymptotic comparison to other PCS schemes. I'm going to skip over this um, a bit now because I'll, I'll give you a bit more detailed information. Uh, I want to mention the work that we've done uh, since the fall when we released this paper. So we have new work, Darker, which I won't go into the technical details of. Benedict gave a talk about that at the VDF day. Uh, but the highlights are that the, there are both performance and security improvements. So we can get security, which is only based on the RSA assumption, rather than having these other assumptions like uh, low order and adaptive root. The eval prover time is brought down to scaling um, basically like square root of D with some other uh, polylog terms, which is a substantial improvement over the, uh, you know, towards getting much more practical prover times. Computing a commitment is still linear in the degree, but this means that the eval time is going to be uh, an insignificant part of the computation compared to computing a commitment when we plug this into a snark. It is also of independent interest that we can get a, um, you know, an asymptotically squared of D eval protocol. And the verifier time stays about the same. The proof size increases slightly to 3 log D instead of 2 log D. So to give you concrete sizes, if we were to use 3048-bit 3, RSA, this would be around 23 kilobytes. This is using the, the larger, darker um, protocol, which has faster um, evaluation times, slightly larger proofs. With 600-bit class groups, we would get around 12.9 kilobytes. With this really new Jacobian uh, group of unknown order, we would get all the way down to 3.2 kilobytes. 
So we, we're very really excited to see whether this, um, whether this new group of unknown order holds up. I want to mention that if you're evaluating on a zero polynomial, then you don't actually need to send any field elements, so these numbers come slightly down. And that actually ends up being the case when we plug this into the machinery that allows us to build a snark. So uh, rough prototype performance. Uh, this implementation was done by developers at Fedora, Philippe Camacho and Fernando Krell. The, um, the performance charts basically show you that the, the, the new darker uh, protocol is a substantial improvement over, over the old one. Um, and if we were to extrapolate the prover time of, uh, for the evaluation protocol using the new improvements that we've made since the fall, then we're looking at about under 70 second time for evaluation on a, on a polynomial of degree that goes up to 1 million. So now let me just say a few words about plugging, in, plugging this into the machinery to build a snark. You've heard about this yesterday, so I'll, I'll go over this pretty quickly. Um, basically, the modern paradigm is to construct constraint systems based on polynomial testing um, to build these information theoretic protocols that involve polynomials and then to replace and evaluating polynomials on points and then to replace those polynomial evaluations by, um, by polynomial commitments and polynomial commitment evaluation protocols. So abstractly, the prover is sending first oracles to the verifier and then the verifier is querying on points. That gets replaced with sending polynomial commitments to the verifier and then running these evaluation protocols. Um, the interactive evaluation protocols would be then compiled with Fiat Shamir in order to get non-interactive evaluation protocols, um, which then leads us to a snark. There's also some interaction as well in the, in the, in the polynomial um, oracle proof part, so that also gets included in the Fiat Shamir compilation to a snark. Here's a variation on Ethereum from, uh, from Plunk, just to have something specific that I can now plug Dark into. Um, so there is a three-round uh, polynomial interactive oracle proof that has just two pre-processed oracles, uh, three online oracles, degree 3n, and five queries with non-zero outputs, uh, and eight queries overall. So we compile this using the paradigm that I basically described, replacing the oracles with polynomial commitments and the evaluations with the eval, eval protocol. Uh, an important optimization, which um, I won't go into the details of right now, is that we can actually open a commitment at multiple points by sending no field elements. And so for the dark protocol, this um, is based on the homomorphic properties of the dark protocol. It leverages the monomial homomorphism. Um, and what ends up happening is that the cost of opening at k different points is actually just one extra commitment and one eval on a zero polynomial. This technique actually generalizes, and this is explored in a paper that, um, by uh, Bonnet, Justin Drake, myself, and Ariel Gabizon that you can look up um, on ePrint. And it describes this more generally for, for, for both Kate polynomials and additive polynomial commitment schemes. So putting this all together, if we look at the dark version of Planck, so plugging dark into Planck, we get a proof size that consists of five field elements, four commitments, and one eval of degree 3n. So with 1,600-bit class groups, that's around 10 kilobytes, with um, with 303-bit Jacobians, this is going to be, you know, under three, under three kilobytes. And the, 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 the verifier time is milliseconds. The prover time is relatively expensive. If we move to darker, we get slightly larger proofs. Still, for, for class groups, it's, you know, around 14 kilobytes. For the Jacobian, it would be only 3.2 kilobytes. And based on our, on, our, on our estimates, although take this with a, with a grain of salt because we need to really run this um, more carefully, a prover time will be about 700 seconds. This is with uh, one, one microsecond class group operations. 
So very, very, very rough comparison of snarks. Take this all with a huge grain of salt. I'm just trying, to, it's very hard to give comparisons of these systems because you have to do the benchmarks carefully on the same, and I don't want to insult anyone as well. Like, take this with a huge grain of salt. If there are numbers here, shout out from the crowd that are, they're wrong. I'm just trying to give you a general picture of where things fit in. So, um, in terms of proof sizes, as I was, you know, saying over and over, the, the universal setup and, and trusted setup snarks give you really small proof sizes you know, um, three to four kilobytes for universal setup, just 0.2 kilobytes uh, for Groth 16. Bulletproofs are, are, are very small as well, but they have uh, poor verifier time. If you, if, if you look at on the other end of the spectrum, the quantum secure transparent snarks, then you're in the range of, you know, 100 to 300 kilobytes. And uh, class group dark is gonna be around 10, you know, to 14 kilobytes. Jacobian dark, if it works, will be super exciting because it's now down in the range of the universal setup snarks, around three to four kilobytes. As for verifier time, um, the best performance is still from the, from the you know, Planck or Groth 16 or Marlin, um, you know, less than 10 milliseconds, say around two milliseconds. Um, Fractal performs very well as well, around less than 10 milliseconds. For us, this is going to be more around 75 milliseconds. And the, based on the work that we've done to bring down the prover time, we're now in the same ballpark as these other systems, um, like FRI-based uh, SNARKs, like Fractal and Stark, et cetera. We're still going to be, say, about you know, seven, to, seven, times, seven to 10 times slower than Gross 16 or, or the K-Planck. Okay, thank you very much. I hope that gave you a good overview of, um, of the dark polynomial commitment scheme, our new transparent snark, and the progress that we've made since the fall. I can take any questions if there's time. Thank you, Ben. There is a mic here, or oh, raise your hand. Hi, Ben. Uh, really Hi. awesome work. I Thank had you. a question about the evaluation proof. Uh, yes. I'm sure you guys have thought about this, uh, but maybe you could uh, elucidate what's wrong with using a KZG-style approach to an evaluation proof where you commit to a quotient and you prove that the quotient times x minus the evaluation point equals the... Uh, yeah. Yeah, so uh, the short answer is it, it just doesn't work. <laughs> uh, but we can, you know... It would be really nice, actually, we were trying to get a constant size uh, polynomial commitment scheme from groups of unknown order. Um, but we can talk offline about sure. what, what we ran into with trying to make that idea work. Yeah. Cool, thanks. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you.